KETV Newswatch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Now I'm going to re reach across the aisle to work with whomever, just like I did as a commander. I didn't care who was Republican or Democrat. I'm going to push the ball down the field in these areas so we can make progress, because it's about saving the opportunity for our kids. It's about saving our freedoms. It's about ensuring we have security. Now, again, I, I praise Brad for being a nice man, and I, I, I like talking to him. And we're going to be friends for the rest of our lives here. But General Don Bacon thinks he's a better choice to represent you in Washington for the next two years. And he's hoping if you live in the 2nd Congressional District that you'll give Representative Brad Ashford the boot and vote for him this November. Well, good morning. I'm Rob McCartney. You're watching a special Commitment 2016 edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. For the next several weeks, we'll be focused on issues leading up to the election. Last week, we spent the half hour talking about the death penalty. Well, this week and next, we're going to focus on one of the hottest congressional races in the country, Nebraska's 2nd District. This morning, we're talking with Don Bacon. Next week, incumbent Democrat Brad Ashford will be here. And we will post each of these shows online at KETV.com, along with the debate we hosted last week as well. Now, before we talk with General Bacon, let's look at his background. He graduated from Northern Illinois with a degree in political science. He earned master's degrees from the University of Phoenix and the National War College. Bacon joined the Air Force in 1985, served nearly 30 years, retiring as a brigadier general. He had 16 assignments around the world, served at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, he was deployed four times during his career to the Middle East, commanded an electronic warfare squadron during the invasion of Iraq. He also had a year-long tour in Baghdad during the surge in 2007 and 8. Four assignments at Offutt Air Force Base and is currently an assistant professor at Bellevue University teaching undergraduate leadership courses. And joining me now is General Don Bacon. General, thanks for being here today. Thank you. It's I, good to be here. I got a couple questions first off. We got a lot we want to get through about the presidential race. Right. After the 2005 tapes uh, surfaced about Donald Trump's comments about women, you put out a news release saying his continued candidacy guarantees a Clinton victory. So is it fair to say that by supporting your party's nominee, you are then, in fact, helping guarantee a Clinton victory? Well, he is our no nominee. It's between those two choices. And I thought those comments were, they were poor, in very poor taste, and I wanted to make a clear stand about them. And I have a, a long record in the United States Air Force uh, protecting the rights of men and women, and I took some strong stands in the Air Force on sexual assault, one of the best program in the Air Force as a commander down at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. I thought it was important to make a, a clear stand on the statements. Having said that, we have two candidates, and as I've mentioned in some of the debates, you may have heard it, if I would have made those comments as a commander, I would have been fired. But if I would have done the things that Hillary Clinton did as a commander, I would have been court-martialed and very much, very likely have gone to jail. Those classified emails, 2,000 of them, on our secret agents, also on our targeting in Iraq and Syria. Uh, so it's, so the actions were inappropriate, or the, the words were inappropriate, but the actions in my mind, particularly as someone who served in the military with clearances, were criminal. But I think it's even beyond that. It's also, what do you think about policy? And I agree with more policy stands of Donald Trump than I do Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton, I, I agree with very little on. I mean, she wants to expand government. She wants to raise taxes. We already have the highest business tax in the free world. She wants to make it higher. Uh, and I, I think she's taken us down a more socialist path. And here's another one. She said during the campaign she wants to do federally funding of abortions. I just think she's an extreme on many of these positions. So in the end, I'm going to support our nominee over Hillary Clinton. Okay. Now, some Republican candidates across the country are basically shifting their argument for mm -hmm. voting for them. Not so much um, support me, but more support me because I can be a balance to a Clinton presidency. Mm -hmm. Kind of hearing the same thing from yours after our last debate. Is that, you see that a shift as Trump's not going to win this thing? Well, he could still win this thing, uh, but we have to see, so hopefully, some bump up in the polls. And it's interesting, I go around the district, I find folks who've never voted Republican in their life are voting Republican this, this cycle. So I think we don't really know what to anticipate. And, you know, Donald Trump's going to have to work hard and get out there, and, get, and he's doing that. I'm going to do the same in our race. I'm going to work 14, 15 hours a day all the way through the election. And in the end, our, our race is separate. But I think I'm not going to be a blank check for... 
either candidate in the end. I mean, we're, I'm going to support our district and be loyal to the Constitution. That's, that's my goal. Right. And whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, I'm going to agree with Donald Trump on more issues than I will with Hillary Clinton, having said that. But in the end, I'm not a blank check for anyone. Okay. Well, let's talk about your race. Your career, as we pointed out, has been in the military. And in the military, when a general such as yourself says jump, the response is how high? I mean, no questions. A general says, says you do. Uh, in Congress, completely different animal here. How is there a question? And I know there is a question of how can a military mind fit into a political atmosphere? Well, first of all, let's think of some of our greats. Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, he he went to become a president as a four-star or five-star general. Yeah, but right? a president says jump, you say how high. <laughs> well, That's not saying, a congressman. <laughs> I'm saying that we have had folks that have made the transition in the political world uh, well. Uh, as a commander, I had to work with other commanders. It's not about saying jump and how high. And I don't think we command that way anymore for that matter. But as a wing commander, I had to work with nine other wing commanders or base commanders in Europe. As the base commander at Offutt, I had to work with 22 other base commanders and you give and take. And on down, when I was a squadron commander of say 365 people, we had 30 other squadron commanders on base, right? So you have to do the give and take on resources. I think also as a commander, you don't just say jump and everybody just says how high. You know, you, you have to balance resources. You want to get the inputs from folks in your unit and what the priorities and goals are. And you, so I, I don't, it's not as rigid, the military, as okay. many folks. I know your father right. has that experience. You have a little bit of that, but yep. I think it's not like a lot of people think. Okay. Now, I'm going to go to Congress. I will be collegial. Uh, I will work across the aisle. There are goals that we have to work towards if we want to keep our country strong. I worry about where our country is going. If we don't make changes, our country is not going to be the economic powerhouse it was. The opportunity is going to be lacking. And I think our security has been threatened the last seven, eight years under the leadership of the current administration. So I want to work hard to achieve goals. Mm -hmm. And it's not about a part partisanship with me. It's about achieving goals for this country. It's defending our country in a different way. FYI, when my dad, who was who retired as a colonel, says jump, I do say you how did. high. Well, FYI. I do it with my dad so, too. So, yeah, that's, that's just what you do. <laughs> my hey, dad was a marine, so. I put, oh, I, you really say how I, high? I you don't even say how high. You just jump as high as you can. Uh, term limits. Yeah. If you win, how many limit? How many terms would you serve? Well, I would serve as long as I'm being useful. But I support term limits for across the board. Mm -hmm. I don't think Nebraskans would want one of their guys. So I'm going to automatically just term limit myself. So I'm not going to just term limit myself. However, I think for the the institution, we would be well served to have term limits. And the reason I say that, you know, when Abraham Lincoln, when he was elected to Congress in 1846, 50% of the congressmen switched out. Imagine if that happened today. It would be a good thing. Today, it's about 5%, typically, 5, 10% on the high end. And we, it's the number one career field in Congress is career politician. Number two is lawyer. And I think we need more folks who have succeeded on the outside and bring those successes and that experience into Congress. But what we have today are a lot of successful legislators who know how to work with lobbyists, and it's not working. Gotcha. Let's talk money a little bit, campaign contributions. We have a graphic that shows your opponent has raised over one and a half million dollars, spent nearly a half million. You've raised $650,000, spent nearly a half million. Been a lot of outside spending. Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee spent over a half million dollars in ads against you. Right. But the House Majority PAC has spent about the same amount against your opponent. Mm -hmm. NRA, National Rifle Association, spent 10000 supporting you. National Republican Congressional Committee spent $1.6 million against your opponent. I mean, these are some big numbers. Yeah. It's going to be about $6 million total. Right. All that said, yeah. I mean, what kind of impact has money had on the campaign? Well, money helps you get your story out. I personally don't like it. It's a, when you travel, I would like, when you talk to people, the political pros, instead of asking, hey, what's your message? Why are you running? And I think that's the most important question. It a lot is. of folks will say, how much money have you raised? I, I think that's a little bit of the distasteful side of what we're doing. But if you love your country and you want to be a strong voice for fiscal responsibility, for pushing back a bureaucracy that's choking business, and you want to take your experience of serving your country in the military into Congress so we have good policy on our national security. I'm, I'm willing to go through this because I think it's important. Uh, I think it's one of the distasteful parts of running those, uh, raising the money. But let's uh, talk about that. It's going to be $6 million, and the data that you have is from a previous quarter. Right. Uh, we, we have a whole other three months of data now right. since then. And I will tell you that the Nancy Pelosi and, the, and her political action committees, there's mm -hmm. two of them that she's affiliated with, 
are going to spend nearly $3 million to defeat me and help uh, my opponent uh, win. And it's all been based, most of it's been based on one lie, that I'm going to raise the retirement age for all those currently in retirement or nearing retirement. That's what those ads are based on. Mm -hmm. In reality, I was talking about folks who are under 30 that we need to anticipate that because our life expectancies are increasing so much. If we want to keep the program solvent, uh, those who are younger will have to expect it. But they have twisted that and said, oh, those who are in retirement or nearing retirement. I just want you to know, I want our audience to know out there that it's not true. But they're spending nearly $3 million to tell that story. Now, I've raised $1.2 million to date. And a lot of that doesn't go towards TV. But I have to counter $3 million of lie ads. It's tough. We're gonna so get, it's a bad part of that, but a bad part of the race. Got you. I'm going to get to the Social Security mm -hmm. thing in a little bit. But staying on the campaign mm -hmm. issue, would you vote against, if it came back up, would you vote against Citizens United? I would lean against voting against it. Or I would, here's why. I think. So, no. You know, no, right. Because how you spend your money is part of your freedom, if you ask me. So, let's say that I feel like wind energy and solar energy is the most important thing in my life. Well, I should be able to contribute two or three thousand or, or ten, whatever it may be, to groups that believe the way I do and then allow them to help lobby and, infl and put ads out. I think that that is part of our process. I th what I think the problem is, though, is this money that is going is typically going towards incumbents only because 95 percent re-election rate. That's why I think we need term limits. That's another way to help bust up the money. But I think how you spend your money and what groups you want to affiliate with is part of our freedom a speech, and I, I would be reluctant to constrain that. All right, let's get into some of those issues. Let's go to Social Security, as you mentioned. Uh, what age? You said in their 30s. What age should the retirement age be? Well, sometimes you have to work with the, the guys with the calculators right. and, and, you know, the, the glasses that are putting through all the data. Right. I, I anticipate it be another year or two increase. I, I would, what, my goal is to keep it solvent. You know, it used to be 42 people paying in for every one taken out. Now it's three paying in for every one taken out, and with no change, it's going to be two people paying in for everyone taken out. And it's, I think just people know on the surface it's unaffordable. Now, I think a lot of folks have come up to me, or a lot of folks have, said, Don, thanks. You're being a leader. You're, you're speaking the truth. But those who are under 30 are going to live till they're 84 years old. Right. And when, when Social Security was created, the life expectancy was under the Social Security payout time. I mean, people were, life expectancy was 63. Mm -hmm. and. Social Security started paying when they were 65. Now we're at 78, and the retirement age is going to 67. Right. It's going to soon be 84. I just think we have to be honest. And if we want to keep it solvent, we have to make hard decisions. And, and I don't think it's anything like a year-for-year -year adjustment, but it has to be a little bit. Okay, let me ask you, you're what, 52, 53 years old? 53. 53, years 53 years don't years tell old. anybody that. I won't tell anybody. Okay. This will be our little secret. Uh, <laughs> you're still younger than I am. Uh, don't tell anybody I know, that I either. I ain't buying that. <laughs> it's true, but thank you. Uh, so let me ask you, yeah. uh, would you be affected by this personally? Probably not. I'm going to be affected by the current adjustment that mm -hmm. goes to 67. Right. Uh, but my children would be affected by it. And have they told you anything? No, I have not heard uh, complaints. Now, I have had people out in the street are, are mad. And I said, and there were retirees. I said, well, my plan does not affect you. I'm talking about people 30 and younger. Okay. And, I, and I would have, we'd have to modify based on what the, the experts, when you look at the actual data, but that's my rough concept there. Okay. But I, most young folks, I have had very little pushback from the young folks. Most young folks don't even think they're gonna get social security. Right. Because they think it's that broke. Absolutely. And well, I, wanna, I wanna go through, and we've got a bunch of issues here. Healthcare, mm -hmm. Affordable Care Act, uh, just in, briefly, give me some specific changes that you'd make. Okay, first of all, we want to make insurance portable. Okay. So we know most young folks switch jobs over 12 times. I think people should find the coverage they like and be able to go from job to job to job with that coverage and have the employer help uh, you know, pay in for those premiums. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important thing. We need more market-based reforms where insurances are competing more. Right now, yeah. we're going to only have two insurance agencies or companies mm -hmm. competing for the individual care here in Nebraska. Over a third of the states now, it's down to one. So we've got to have more competition. Right. But we also need more health care providers competing. So even our governor, in a speech, I heard him say that he had to get some, I think it was an MRI, if I remember right. Right. And he called three people. He went up to Chicago. Yep. Yeah, he went up, well, he went three people, and he found one half the price of the highest priced one. If we had more of that, we could hold down prices. We have to reform FDA. The FDA, mm -hmm. it takes way too long to produce you know, the approvals for mm -hmm. new pharmaceuticals. Right. And what they do is they take several dozen actions and they do them sequentially. 
A lot of that can be done in parallel so we get it through faster. Mm -hmm. There's also a loophole when we look at patents. So pharmaceutical companies, when they get a patent, if it's really making a lot of money for them, they can make a minor adjustment to whatever it is, and then right. they can extend their patent. We should stop that, because what it is, it's prohibiting or limiting competition. Okay. We need to get generics out there faster. I think we need to do tort reform. You know, defensive medicine adds 15% to right. the cost. But I want to get healthcare back to the state level, not run by a federal bureaucrat in Washington. Nebraska can do some things that we would like versus maybe what Massachusetts would want to do with their care. Gotcha. So I'd like to have some county options there that tailors it for Nebraska's needs. Okay. That's All just right. the tip of the iceberg. There are proposals by Congressman Dr. Price. He's an orthopedic surgeon, mm -hmm. has a lot of these proposals. I'm only giving you about half of them, frankly. Well, that's good. I mean, we, I'm sure we can go to your website and yeah. check them out on those. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. We're going to take a quick break. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation in 90 seconds. You're watching KETV News. You're watching KTV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Joining us this morning is Republican Don Bacon running for Congress in Nebraska's 2nd District. Continuing our conversation now, uh, General Bacon, terrorism obviously a hot button issue. You support sending more troops on the ground overseas to the Middle East? Absolutely not. I think more troops on the ground would be a mistake. I think we should be helping more in the background, uh, maybe some special forces, but our air, our air should be the dominant uh, force there, but also our leadership. We can't win this fight against ISIS unless we bring a better coalition with our Sunni allies and the Sunni uh, tribes and the Sunni countries. That's how we won in Iraq in 2008-9. It was the Sunni tribes that turned on Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We've got we to replicate this more broadly uh, for ISIS, but we've undermined it with our agreement with Iran. Okay. Those countries fear Iran more than they do ISIS. But, Sec well, I'm going to okay. go keep okay. so we can move along. Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah James, told me uh, the Air Force is on track to be the smallest in its history. Mm -hmm. uh, you know this, obviously, coming from the Air Force. The Heritage Foundation rated all the branches and says the overall military capability is marginal. Now, the problem is multiple threats. Mm -hmm. Argument, U.S. is able to handle what's called a single major regional conflict, right. UN MRC. Uh, basically, we have one front mm -hmm. war. That's not what we're fighting now. And we have been fighting for several years, you know, a right. number of years. We have multiple fronts. Um, are you willing to give more money to the military with that in mind? Yes. Short answer, yeah. we've cut the military 17% in the budget. Right. And we said you can't cut bases and you can't cut weapon systems. So what we've done, we've cut training, we've cut people, we've cut future weapon systems. And the net result of all that, we are a less capable military today. And you're right, it used to be you had to fight two fronts at once. Mm -hmm. Now, and then it became fight one, hold, then win. Right now, the units back at home station are unable to deploy in a timely manner. That's bad for deterrence, and I think it makes war more likely, and it's, it's bad for us. We've we got to improve training and our readiness, and we have to get some more of the combat capabilities that will win on the battlefield delivered faster, which is stealth technology, for example. Right. And our nuclear deterrence is extraordinarily outdated. we got to, we got to work on that as well. Right. Homegrown terrorism. Which personal liberties would you be willing to give up in name of national security? None. None? Yep. I believe in protecting our Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. and I believe in being as vigilant as, as we can. Now, I think we did make some smart decisions after 9-11. One of them was we did a better coordination with our intelligence agencies. And there's things that we can do smarter, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, we had some information on 9-11 that wasn't being shared from one agency to another agency. The picture was all there, but people only saw sections of the picture. So we've made some smart changes, but I don't think we should compromise our individual liberties for safety at all, because what makes our country special is our individual liberties, but we have to fight and defend them, and we have to take the fight to ISIS, and we have to undermine that homegrown threat. And how we do that is not by compromising our liberties, mm -hmm. it's by going after the internet sites that are being propagated out of Syria and Iraq right now, but they're using that to recruit people all over the world to, to include the United States. Do you feel safe? Generally, yes. I just, I think we're in a less safe world than we have been, but I still feel safe. But you know, I'm mm -hmm. a believer. I know in the end I'm in God's hands. I got you. One, one way or the other way, I'm in his hands. Let me ask this, do you have a gun? Yes. Do you have a gun? Do you think the gun control laws should be stricter or looser? I think we're in the right spot right now. I think, I, I don't want to restrict them more. And I, th I think we got the right, right level of freedoms when it comes to our gun rights. Mm -hmm. So does that bother you if uh, there's talk, sheriffs are concerned, uh, possibly if Clinton gets elected, that there may be a change to the Second Amendment? Well, I would oppose it. Uh, it, it's absolutely right. Uh, Hillary Clinton wants to restrict our Second Amendment gun rights, despite what she said at the debate uh, recently. 
Uh, we, we need to defend our Second Amendment rights. My, my view of it is 99% of our citizens are law-abiding, great people. Why do we want to restrict their rights? We should be more worried about the 1% who are the lawbreakers. We want to hold people accountable when they break the law, not go after the 99% and restrict their freedoms. Immigration, briefly, build a wall, don't build a wall. I'm not into a wall from coast to coast. I think you build it where you need it. So let's do it smartly. Okay. I want to ask this. This is a philosophical question. I've asked it of other candidates mm -hmm. in the past. How do you see elected officials on divisive issues with your constituency? Should you vote how you think your constituents want you to vote, or should you vote how you want to vote? I believe it's you listen, hear what the views are, because I don't know everything. I know that. It's good to hear other inputs, and it's good to broaden your perspective. But in the end, I think you have to vote your conscience and then defend it. And if, if the district doesn't like it, they're going to vote you out. And I think that's a better, I think that's the way our system was made. So you, you go out there and you contend for your views and why, and you listen, right. and then you vote your conscience. And if your constituents don't like it, they vote you out, they fire you. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to be right back with some final thoughts. First, we have a reminder, your comments are an important part of the show. If you want to be heard, email those comments to news at KETV.com. Let us know what you think about Don Bacon and his campaign. Love hearing from you, and we'll be right back. with Don Bacon, Republican candidate for Congress in the second district. Don't have much time left. We want to give you a chance to make a final appeal to voters. So well, thank you. The floor is yours. Well, I'd like you to know I love our country. Our country is the greatest country that's ever existed. We have great opportunity for our, the best opportunity for our kids and grandkids. And uh, we live in a most powerful country with the greatest freedoms, the oldest democracy. But if we don't make changes, that future is at risk. We have a debt that's out of control at 19.7 trillion, a federal bureaucracy that is killing small business. We've lost the checks and balances in our constitution that's kept us so special. The president's been working around Congress. We need to fix a broken tax code. It's 78,000 pages. And really our foreign policy, I, I believe has been failed, particularly the last seven or eight years. I'm running to be a leader. I wanna make a difference in each of these areas. I will reach across the aisle uh, to, to make, make these fixes, but it's about defending our country. It's about ensuring that our kids and grandkids have the same freedoms, the same opportunity uh, that we have had. And that's why I'm running. So I would be very honored to have your vote and your support, and I will work hard to serve every single person in this district. Thank you. General Bacon, thank you very much for thank being you, here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you it. Again, next week we're talking with Democrat incumbent Brad Ashford. We'll have this show and that one, along with the debate we hosted last week, online. It's at KETV.com. Don't forget, we have some deadlines for you. You have until this Friday to register to vote in person. Have until Wednesday, November 2nd, to request a ballot be mailed to you. And you can vote early through Election Day if you bring your ballot to the election office by 8. If you're going to mail in your ballot, needs to be at election headquarters by the 8th, so you'll probably want to mail it by Saturday the 5th. Polls are open Tuesday, November 8th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And remember, you can't complain about the election's outcome if you don't participate. I'm Rob McCartney. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next Sunday morning for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. And remember, vote.